Take your Bible and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, pick up in verse 3. 1 Samuel 2, 3. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start. Lord, I pray that you'll take in a bless the studying of your word this evening. I pray that we'll take the things in your word to our heart, that we'll learn from it, that you'll take in a help us to grow closer to you from it. I pray that you'll wash me now in your precious blood. I pray that you'll fill me with your Holy Spirit and uh, just help me say all the things that I should. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, verse uh, 3. Now we've talked quite a bit about Hannah's prayer here, but I'm uh, just given the practical application of the verse, not so much the doctrinal. There's things that we can take and learn, so I want to go through her prayer pretty quickly, and then we're going to go to the next section of Scripture with Eli's sons. But verse 3, it says, Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. Now verse 3, you'll find that God always judges the proud. He says, uh, speak no more so proudly or arrogant. Uh, the proud and the arrogant is not... Uh, you can go through the Bible. I've always challenged people, go through your Bible and find one spot where pride or proud is used in a good context. The Lord has a chip on His shoulder toward men being proud. That's something that you, very few people actually learn. And y'all study the Word of God and see how God views pride. He wants you to be humble, especially when it comes to Him, His Word, and the Bible. Now let me just give you a couple of verses real quick on pride. And I can give you probably four times the amount of verses that I'm going to give you. But real quickly, let's go through some. Book of Job. The book of Job. Look at Job 26.12. Job 26, 12. And you'll start getting the uh, view of God's view on pride. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his stun, uh, understanding he smiteth through the proud. Uh, look at Job 40. Job 40. Job chapter 40. Look at verse 12. Job 40, 12. Look on every one that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. So he humbles them. Uh, look at Psalms. Psalms chapter 12. Psalms chapter 12. Look at verse 3. Psalms 12, 3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things even the mouth that speaks proud things. Uh, Proverbs 16.5 Proverbs 16.5 Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Now uh, with the Lord, you can't even be proud in the heart. Uh, sometimes a proud person can fool people and thinking he's more humble than what he is when he's actually proud in the heart. And sometimes people will come across proud, but they're actually very humble in the heart. Uh, so, uh, sometimes it's very hard for us as men to judge somebody whether they're truly proud or not. I'll tell you right now, I have mixed feelings in trying to judge our president. I mean, sometimes I think that guy's very proud. And then sometimes I look at him like, well, that wasn't the action of a proud man. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> you know. I don't know about him. <laughs> but the Lord will know. Now, uh, but he's in a position where it would be very easy for him to get proud. And that's a danger. Uh, what you'll find it, through the Christian life, and the, or at least this is the way it is with me, I have to judge myself regularly to see if I'm getting proud or not. And you'll catch yourself. 
You have to continually put yourself down and abase yourself. Why? Because if you'll judge yourself, then God won't judge you. Look at 1 Peter 5, 5. Now here's the last one I'll give you. I could probably give you 15 more verses on pride. It's all through the Bible. All through the Bible. But this one right here shows you how God deals with the pride. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. It says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace, un- grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. When it comes to coming to the Lord, you should always come humbly. There is no need for you to ever approach God with a proud heart. It's not going to work with Him. I heard a guy preach a message why God was proud once. And he was trying to go off the verse, the high and lofty one. But that's not true at all. God humbles Himself to even deal with man, the Bible says. And it talks about Jesus Christ as humbling Himself. Even God Himself humbles Himself. So He expects it out of you. He's going to expect it out of you. If God Almighty will humble Himself, He's going to ask you to humble yourself. Uh, Back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Verse 4. The the bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with strength. So what's going to go, what she's going to do in her prayer is give a contrast. A contrast of how God deals with man. And he'll obey some and he'll lift some up. And in our viewpoint, with men, sometimes God's viewpoint is very different. God will look at the weak, the humble, and the poor. And he's going to lift them up one day. He's going to allow them to go through that part of life. Be, and those people sometimes are the best saints. Where the ones that are the mightiest, the richest, and the most proud, God's going to humble them one day. And it really comes to the heart. When it comes to saints, people that love the Lord, I have found sometimes that the poorest of people are the most godly. Sometimes. I wonder sometimes, I've always had this imagination. And this is just my imagination. I mean, this ain't God, but this is my imagination. But you get into these preachers' conference, and they'll sit there and they'll uplift this one guy that has this huge work, huge school, and all, done all this stuff, and they'll just make him sound like this guy that is above reproach. And I'll grant it, it seems that God's using him, and that's fine. But they'll sometimes they'll exalt him a little bit too high. They'll say, well, he's the mightiest Christian in the world today or something like that because they have such a high esteem of them. And, uh, and I can usually, the ones that are truly serving the Lord, they'll sit there and squirm when they, when they are being bragged on like that. They don't like it. <laughs> Which I don't blame them. I wouldn't like it either. But uh, they get exalted. And uh, I sat there and but you sit there, the greatest Christian of all time, and I sit there and I wonder... I wonder at the judgment seat of Christ if the Lord's going to show us who the greatest Christian that ever lived was. And my imagination comes to this. It'll probably be some black woman, dirt poor, out of the middle of southern Alabama that had nothing. (laughs) And the Lord will call her up and say, the greatest Christian of all time prayed more than anyone, was closer to me than anyone. Uh, you, you know, I know it's not going to be me. I know myself well enough. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's just my imagination. Somebody that nobody would have thought of. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Alright. The, but So there will be a contrast here through our prayer. In verse 4, The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they stumble, are girded with strength. Look at that with a cross-reference of Psalms 37. Psalms chapter 37. Psalms chapter 37. And pick up verse 14. Now what's interesting, this is uh, a psalm of David. 
Now David goes from a shepherd boy to a mighty soldier and a mighty king. Uh, Psalms chapter 37, and let's pick up verse 14. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. So David's uh, shown how the Lord deals with the mighty. Now in all these things with Hannah and with the verses that I'm showing you, it's the Lord dealing with the mighty when they're wicked. Uh, not all rich are righteous. Not all mighty are righteous. Amen? Sometimes it's the poor. Sometimes it's the weak that are the righteous. So now if a man's rich and he's righteous, the Lord may still humble him, but he's not humbling for the purpose of wickedness. Uh, Job was a rich and mighty man. And Lord, the only reason the Lord humbled him was as a test to prove the devil wrong. So uh, your judgment on why God's doing something, you have to be real careful with. You don't always understand what God's doing with an individual. And usually the one that understands it most is the individual that's going through it. Your understanding when it comes to judging people, I mean, if it's a direct sin and you can see he's real wicked, okay, you can see God judging him. But uh, sometimes I've seen Christians like, oh, God did this to him because of that. And I'll look at what they say the excuse was, and I'll say, well, the punishment doesn't match the crime. The punishment doesn't match the crime. And isn't the Lord just? Yes, yeah, the Lord's just. Well, wouldn't the punishment match the crime? Well, you probably got the wrong crime. Or the wrong reason. You know, anybody, anybody, you can find something something sinful about them to say, oh, that's why God did it. Anybody you can do that to, but are you actually accurate? You see what I'm saying? Are you actually accurate? I'd be careful with that stuff. you got to be a little bit careful when it comes to that stuff. Verse 5. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 5. They that were full have I hired themselves out... Uh, for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is wax feeble. So uh, there's the full of bread. Uh, there's a verse in the, I forget where it is, but it was talking about what the sins of Sodom were. And one of them was fullness of bread and idleness was the problem of Sodom and Gomorrah. Fullness of bread and idleness. Brother, you know which one I'm talking about? Where's that reference? A person was talking to me this week about their brother, and their brother was turned against Christianity a little bit. Or not really against Christianity, but against preachers and stuff. And he ran into this one preacher, and uh, this preacher told him he couldn't come to the church anymore because he wasn't making so much money and only if he made so much money was he actually in the blessing of God uh, well I would have left that church too I mean to be honest I mean I wouldn't have sat under that kind of a preacher but that is totally con that's called prosperity gospel where if you're serving God God's going to prosper you that's not true that's not true at all God will glorify you in your time or in his time but that may be an eternity. Uh, the abundance of your wealth doesn't make you righteous or not righteous. Ezekiel 16. Let me show you this one. Now we know Sodom and Gomorrah was wicked. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 48 and 49. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not, hath not done she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, alright, we dealt with pride. Fullness of bread, 
There's Hannah's second point. Uh, fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So was a lack of food one of Sodom's problems? No. They were rich. And they were idle. Write this down. The idle mind is the devil's workshop. The idle mind is the devil's workshop. Huh? Sounds like America. No. You know what America's problem is? They have too much time and money to experience sin. And the flesh is never satisfied, so they experience sin farther and farther. You, you know, people that have to go out and work 14 hours a day to put food on the table don't have time to experience sin as much. Now, that doesn't mean that they still won't be wicked. But they don't have as much time. Idleness destroys a country. It destroys a city. Too much idleness. Back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. For that were full have hired out themselves from bread, and they that were hungry cease, so that the barren hath borne seven. And she that hath many children is wax feeble. Now we know with Hannah, she was barren, and her adversary was Elkanan's other wife, who had several children. But the prof this, say, this verse where it says the barren hath borne seven has to be some type of prophecy. And the reason I say that is later in the chapter it tells you that the Lord visits Hannah and gives her five more children. It's in verse, um, let's see, where does it say he visits her? in the chapter. Uh, verse 21, And the Lord visited Hannah, so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. Now if my math is right, even if that's not including Samuel, that's just six. Okay. Now I may not be good at math, but <laughs> I think I can get that much. So who's the baron that bears seven? Well that's got to be a prophecy about something. That's not referring to the ones that she bore. All right, back to, uh, and I'm not, I don't know what the prophecy is, but I know the context of the chapter is a prophecy to the tribulation time period and the second advent, uh, tribulation saints. Back to uh, verse um, 6. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. All right, so uh, death and life are controlled by the Lord. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. Now this one is a, this is a hard thing to understand. Uh, it's very difficult. Especially if you've had any dramatic experiences in your life with uh, loss of loved ones through uh, violent deaths. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 39. See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. You say, well, who's saying that? The Lord is. You say, what, what is that showing us? The Lord is in control of absolutely everything that happens to every individual. Now, it may be the devil that does it. The devil is the angel of death, right? The devil is the one that does many things that takes and puts us in a harmful situation. But when it comes to death, when it comes to sickness, you have to always keep in mind, God is always in control, and God is the one that allowed it. So when it comes down to it, you have to look at God and say, you're holy, you're righteous, you know what you're doing. 
I'll be okay with it. And you put down some of the stuff we see that goes on in this world, I'll tell you, that is not easy to do. And what God does, what does it, now this is what He does. He allows things. And through it, He's going to receive honor and glory even though that thing is wicked and the devil does it. You learn that with the book of Job. Because He allows the devil to kill all Job's children. He allows the devil to take and kill his servants and all his cattle, sheep, and ox and uh, camels. And he allows the devil to do all these things to Job. Then he tells Satan, you have caused me to lift my hand against my servant Job without a cause. Yet, the Lord still takes credit for everything the devil did. Why? Because the Lord's all-powerful and He could have stopped them. He could have stopped the devil. And He can give life and He can take it away. Now, we look at it differently than what the Lord does. Because one thing that we do not see is go back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 5. I mean, chapter 2. And look at verse five, uh, 6. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Every person that the Lord allows to die, when they, they die in their righteousness, good people. You say, why does God allow good people to die? Or die violently? Good question. But God knows He's going to bring them back up. The Bible says that precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of His saints. They may have died, but the Lord's going to bring them back up. The Lord's not worried about their death. He allowed it, but He's going to bring them back up. Matter of fact, He's going to make them in a better condition than when they died. What God does to him is actually a merciful thing. It's a merciful thing. He's going to give him a new body that doesn't have any pain, no suffering, no heartache, no sin. And he's going to restore him. Not only does he take the credit for killing, but he's going to make alive again. Now, uh, it, now notice it doesn't say that the Lord maketh alive and killeth. It says the Lord killeth and maketh alive. So he does both directions. Now the wicked, the wicked when they die, he's not going to make them back alive. If a man dies in his sins, he dies in his sins. But the righteous, I mean God's not wicked when he takes their life. He's going to restore it. He's going to restore the thing. That is a concept where you have to be able to see that as a Christian to be able to deal with death. Because if we look at from man's eyes, all we see is the suffering, the hurt, and the loss. And that's enough to drive you nuts. That's enough to drive you nuts. You see all the death that goes on in this world and the, the guilt that goes on, but you don't see what God's going to do. Later down the road, he's going to make it lie. Uh, I had a lady come up to me when I was straight preaching, and she started screaming at me and shaking her fist in front of my face. said, where was your God when my son died in the fire? And she was bitter and mad at God. And then I was young, I didn't know how to answer her. But I should have told her, the same throne where he was when his son died on the cross for your sins. That's the answer. He allows many things. And then when they come to the tomb to weep over Jesus Christ, there's some angels standing there and they say, Why weepest thou? He is not here for He is risen. God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. You, you see, they don't look at death the same way we do. And we, uh, the Lord doesn't go down to the graveyard and say, oh, there's so-and-so. He doesn't look that way. So-and-so's up there. 
He doesn't look at it that way. We look at it that way. When it comes to death of your loved ones and saints, you need to look at it from God's eyes. They're better off. You got some hurt you got to deal with. Okay. You got some hurt you got to deal with. But they're better off. You have to look at things differently. But God takes credit. He, he gives death and He gives life. You know, there is no guarantee that I will ever make it home today. And if I die before I make it home, well, bye-bye. I'm with the Lord. Y'all can cry all you want. But don't cry over me. Cry over you're missing me. <laughs> I mean, I'm gone. I'm going home to be with the Lord. You know, my troubles will be over. It's no big deal for me. That's, that's the blessings of being a Christian and knowing you're saved. Amen? Amen? That's a blessing of having loved ones that you know are saved. The greatest blessing in life is not so much living with somebody, but living with somebody that you know will live for eternity. When your loved ones are saved, that's the greatest blessing in life. It's the greatest blessing in life. Back to uh, verse six, uh, 7. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. We've already talked about the rich and the poor. Verse 8, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit. Now where do they inherit? The throne of glory. Uh, you say, are you preaching the pie in the sky? Yes, I am. Sometimes somebody may go through their entire life as the poor and the lonely. But that doesn't mean they won't be rich and sit on a throne in glory. It depends on how. It doesn't matter what your state of life is on this earth. What matters is how close are you to the Lord and how close is your heart and how much do you serve Him through your state of life. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and He hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. You cannot obtain victory through your own strength. You have to go in the strength of the Lord. Uh, I heard a message down there in Texas. One of them guys preached a message, and he called the message, Welcoming Weakness. Welcoming weakness. Take your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. And the point that he was making is you welcome weakness because when you are weak, then the Lord is strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You can't see the strength of the Lord until He carries you through. And you can't carry yourself through. Then you see the strength in the Lord. And you find out His strength is much more than you could ever obtain. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. And uh, you know, the Lord's going to put you in a position where the only time you're ever going to see His power for what His power really is, is when only He can carry you through. Only He can give you the power to get through. You can't do it in your own strength. There has to come a time in your life where you say, Lord, I cannot do this. I cannot do it. And then you're going to see His power. But not until that time comes. He's made perfect in weakness. That's when we see His strong strength. Verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall He thunder upon them. 
Now that is a prophecy to the second coming of Christ. Cross-reference, Revelation 19 and 20. Second coming of Christ. Shall thunder upon them, the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, as Jesus Christ, and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now Cana went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. So that's Hannah's prayer. And that's a great prophetic prayer in the Bible. Verse 12. Now we're going to take and change thoughts here, and we're going to look at the evil sons of Eli for a minute. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Bilial. They knew not the Lord. That's uh, children of rebellion. That's children of devil. And the verse kind of describes what the... Uh, you'll see that phrase many times, sons of Belial. Uh, a lot of times they'll be associated with idolatry. You can write down uh, Deuteronomy 13.13. 13, good number. Deuteronomy 13.13. 13, that's sons of Belial going after other gods that serve not the Lord. Um, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, they knew not the Lord, and the priest's custom, which the, people, which the people was, that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan, or kettle, or cauldron, or pot, all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself." So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, then take as much as thy soul desireth. Then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Now real quickly, I want to give you five reasons that people are turned against God because of a wicked priest or today a wicked preacher. Many people will not come into churches and hear the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God because of wickedness in preachers. I've talked to many a young man that was backslidden, that got saved when he was young, but is out of serving God, will not serve God, and they have gone completely the opposite direction in rebellion against God because of the in bad influence of some preacher in their life. And unfortunately today, it seems like there's more bad ones than there is good ones. Now here's the marks of a man that does more damage from a pulpit than he does good. First of all, a preacher who does not know God. A preacher that does not know God will do more damage to the cause of Christ than anyone else. He'll make the church abhorred by the people. Uh, you know what people do today? They do not like churches. They do not like preaching. They abhor it because they see the hypocrisy in it. Well, if a preacher does not know God, God's not speaking through him. He's, he's, to him, it's a job. It's a career path. It's something that he wasn't called to do. Now, Samuel was different. He was called. We'll get into studying Samuel. Samuel was a called priest. He was a priest that God set up. Now, these two sons of Eli, they don't even know the Lord, yet they're doing the Lord's work. Not everybody behind a pulpit knows the Lord, serves the Lord, or is even saved. Many of them are not. Preachers who do not know God will cause the Lord's work to be abhorred. A preacher who disregards God's commandment. He disregards it. Now, Leviticus chapter 7, I don't have time to read the full passage. Leviticus 7, 25 through 34, it tells you the correct uh, means that the priest is supposed to take the fat and burn it 
and taking a cook the animal, and he's only supposed to take the one shoulder of the sacrifice. He has certain rules to go by of what he's allowed to take from the sacrifice. Well, what these uh, two sons of Eli are doing, they're just making up their own rules because they're serving their own uh, belly, so they're using the office of the priesthood for their own advantage. And when a preacher does not know the commandments of the Lord and he disregards what the Bible says and does things according to his own will and his own pleasure for his own agenda, he causes the work of the Lord to be abhorred because he doesn't obey the word of God. He doesn't obey the commandments. Uh, The preacher is not above the Bible. You're not above the Bible. You're not above the things that are in the Bible. Number three, preachers who serve their own belly. Preachers who serve their own belly more than God. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And look at verse 17. Philippians 3, 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye walk, ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. If a preacher's God is his own belly and he minds earthly things and he loves money, the Bible says um, the love of money is the root of all evil and some covenant after have erred from the faith. Uh, O man of God, flee these things. The love of money should never be part of a preacher's life. Now that doesn't mean that a preacher can't be blessed with money, but he can't love it. He can't love it. If he's going after money, he's going to cause the Lord's work to be abhorred. Because he's after his own flesh. Satisfying his own flesh. A preacher's going to take a church. Well, how much does it pay first? I can't take it unless they pay me this much. I know a preacher that said that. Mm -hmm. His ministry didn't end well. Mm -hmm. He caused the work of the Lord to be abhorred. That's not a calling. That's not a calling when a preacher does that. Money should never be the issue. Your own belly should not be the issue. I mean, here we are telling you trust the Lord and serve Him and walk by faith. And you can't do that as a preacher? How can you be an example to your people? Number four, a preacher who will not take correct correction. Look at verse 16. And if any man said unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, which is given in Leviticus chapter 7, presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now. And if not, I will take it by force. All right, you know what some preachers do? They use their position to get their way, and nobody can correct them. Well, if you're so proud and arrogant and wicked that nobody in the pew can correct you correctly from the Word of God, you will cause the Lord's work to be abhorred. A preacher is never above correction from the Word of God. And when they get so proud that they cannot be corrected, that's, that causes the people to abhor them. When they're doing wrong. Because, let me tell you, when a preacher's doing wrong in the pulpit, usually the people in the pew can tell. And they can see it. Hey, it's the truth. They can see it. Uh, I've seen the sin of many a preachers while he's preaching. I've seen it many times. It shows up. Uh, the Bible says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, me and Brother Bemis was talking a few weeks back. And he's like, well, if that's in somebody's mouth, he'll say it from the pulpit. And his wife's like, no, they won't. I said, yes, they will. I guarantee you they will. If it's in their heart, it'll come out from the pulpit. It'll come out. Abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. 
And sometimes uh, I've caught myself saying something. I'll look back and I was like, man, there's something in my heart that's wrong. I shouldn't have said that, you know. And I got corrected. Uh, no preacher's perfect. No preacher's perfect. We make mistakes. But a preacher who will not take correct correction. Now I say correct correction because sometimes people will try to correct a preacher all the time because they don't like what he's preaching. No, that's not correct correction. Correct correction is where there's a legit reason to approach them with the Word of God and show them a mistake. And when that correction comes, he needs to take it. Uh, last of all, and we'll close here. Look at verse 22, jumping ahead a little bit. A preacher who will not abstain from open immorality will cause the Lord's work to be abhorred. Verse 22, now... Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Unless, in other words, they were out fornicating with the ones that was coming into the temple. Yeah, that's going to cause the Lord's work to be abhorred. And, uh, huh? That's uh, verse 22. That's number 5. It's uh, a preacher who will not abstain from Open immorality. Open immorality. When a preacher falls into uh, open immorality where everybody knows it, it causes the work of the Lord to be abhorred. Now, I know preachers fall into immorality. Amen? No preacher's perfect. Guess what? I'm, a, I'm flesh just like you. Big eye opener, I'm a sinner. <laughs> I mean, you know... Not proud of it. Not happy with it. I fight it. I try to keep it under control. But I'll tell you, if you, for, if you just say, you know what, my testimony doesn't mean anything. I'm going to go down to the clubs. I'm going to take and participate in all these wicked activities. And You know, I'm just a man. Everybody can take and live with it. You know, that will cause this church to be abhorred. It would cause this. What I do out there that's open sin will cause this church to be abhorred. Abhorred. Open immorality causes a church to be abhorred. And uh, you see it time and time and time again. Anymore through churches. Open immorality with the preachers. I don't know how many preachers that I've heard have to go to. I uh, was asked to pray for a man that was going to a court that was teaching in a Baptist Bible college, and then went to be an assistant pastor. The he was being took to court because many years ago, when he was a assistant or a pastor of a church, he had taken got this 16-year-old girl in his church who was trying to take and babysit for him to take and sleep with him. And now he was getting charged for child molestation. And my answer was, Lord, if it's true, judge him. If it's true, judge him. Don't let him get away with it. I don't know if it was true or not. The people are asking me to pray for him thinks it wasn't true. It's a false accusation. But I looked at the details of it. It looked like it was legit. It looked like it was the real thing. So I just had to back off on and turn it over to the Lord. Turn it over to the Lord. You say, what does that do? It makes the Lord's work be abhorred. And let me tell you, when, and here's the last thing. When judgment comes, it starts in the house of the Lord. A preacher is judged by God quickly and severely if he does not keep his sin in control. It will start in the house of the Lord. A preacher cannot stay in that pulpit and preach this word in a true God-sanctifying church and let his sin go without God judging him. He cannot. He cannot. That man will be removed. And when he's removed, you'll be like, I can't believe that he was doing that. I can't.
can't believe that happened. I've seen it happen time and time and time again with preachers. I haven't seen it happen time and time again. All right, so uh, that's things that make people abhor God's Word. All right, real quickly, let's take some prayer requests.